most of you weren't here a year and a half ago when I spoke at the lunch. Uh, I won't get into all that detail, but I'll give you a few summary items from that summertime talk. But yeah, I've been a uh, financial advisor. Uh, I'll just take a step back. I got an engineering degree from the University of Arizona, went to work for Boeing as my first job out of college, worked uh, at Rocketdyne, which was a Boeing division in California. So lived in the San Fernando Valley and built rocket engines for three years. And two of those years were pretty exciting. It was my dream job to build spaceships. I was a Star Trek junkie, still am. But then uh, my third year, I realized I was too much of a free spirit, too entrepreneurial. And the factory life just kind of was not for me. Um, I was in my early 20s and realized that I was around a bunch of very negative people with very dead-end views on their jobs, and I just wasn't willing to put up with that. So I didn't know what to do. I, I actually you know, sat, you know, I was sitting at dinner with my parents, and I started crying because I didn't know what to do. I, I, my dream job was not my dream job anymore. And my longest, one of my best friends, my longest friend, um, I've known him since first, first grade, he had just gotten a job at Merrill Lynch in downtown Seattle. And I told him I didn't like my job at Boeing anymore. And he said, well, come work with me at Merrill Lynch. You'd be great. And I'm like, well, I'm an engineer. I don't have any financial background uh, other than I'm happy to, I mean, I think it's worth saying that I did get the highest grade in my economics class in college and I self-taught my, you know, I, I spent many, many days in the summers, hot Arizona summers, studying how to make sense of the Wall Street Journal during college. And a lot of people don't do that, but I figure if I ever wanted to make money and have money, I better understand how money works. So I bought the book on the Wall Street Journal Guide to Money and Investing. It was kind of a really cartoony book, more of a handbook. And I bought a Wall Street Journal, and I'd take refuge in this, from the summer heat in Phoenix and just sit and have a cookie and a coffee in a nice air-conditioned coffee shop and, and do that. So I, I kind of taught myself early on, not knowing it would be a career, uh, until all of a sudden when my friends said, hey, come work with me at Merrill Lynch. It'd be great. I'm like, well, I do, I do spend a lot of time researching investments and investing my own money. And... I do really, uh, it did resonate with me. And so I packed up my U-Haul and moved back to Seattle from Los Angeles and went to work at Merrill. And I got my securities license about eight weeks before the dot-com bubble peaked. And for three years, the stock market completely melted down 50%, one of the biggest, cra it was the biggest crash at that time since the 1929 crash. So my timing was pretty nasty. But uh, God provided. He kept me in my chair at Merrill Lynch for three years, even though I think about 20 people came and 18 people went, and me and one other person stuck it out somehow. And just, as, just an aside, the, when I finally got my... I, I was ready to get out of Merrill Lynch at that time because I was so completely discouraged after three years of market torture and high pressure tactics at Merrill Lynch that um, I went and interviewed at Edward Jones and I got, I accepted an offer and um, literally like, so I was, I was on cloud nine because I have a, I have a do over. I have a new future ahead of me. I'm, I'm feeling the dopamine and the serotonin flowing through my body. I'm excited about my future again. And right then I met my wife. And she met me when I was high on life, and still am. And but she she uh, she met me at this perfect time in my life. So it, it was again, God kept me at Merrill for three years, just long enough to meet her. That's the way I look at it. So I went to Edward Jones because it was a, a small town uh, philosophy, small local offices, rather than instead of the bullpen at Merrill Lynch. If any of you ever seen. Some of those financial movies, uh, yeah, they literally said, okay, you got your license, uh, start dialing. And I was like, what? You literally want to get a call out of the phone book? Um, and Did you start with A? Uh, probably. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I approached that. It was terrifying because you can't read anybody. And I hate getting spam calls. And especially back then, it was even worse. 
Uh, so I, I kind of morphed that into doing research on Yahoo Finance and finding some corporate executives and calling them and having a reason. Yeah, Seattle corporate executives that I could uh, touch base with. But anyway, back to Edward Jones, though. I, uh, I hated the bullpen at Merrill. High pressure. And what did it for me was my last cold call, I think, was literally... Hi, this is Michael Christensen at Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch, you guys are all a bunch of crooks. Click. I, like, I got up out of my chair and I walked around the office going, Woo! Put me out! Put me out! You guys won't believe what I just got. Oh my God, this is awful. And I knew that uh, my company was uh, destroying my reputation. So I had to leave. So I, I um, uh, at the time, uh, for a good reason. In 2003, Edward Jones in Fortune Magazine was the number one company to work for in America. And so I literally called the 800 number out of the phone book, uh, went and interviewed with them, and 11 years later, I was a very successful financial advisor at Edward Jones and Love and Life. Uh, had all the things that I could want. Um, Unfortunately, they were keeping 60% of my paycheck, and then after withholding about $300,000 worth of compensation as their cut over a four-year period, they gave me an $11,000 bonus. And I was like, oh, serious gut punch. Uh, okay, so they're keeping about, they're keeping 60% of my paycheck, and every four years they're giving me an $11,000 bonus. And I just, and not only that, but it was hard it was hard doing business in, in my, my ethical way. The, you have to be invested at all times in stocks and bonds or your paycheck stops. The minute you put your clients in cash, you don't receive any income. And after 2008 and 2009, I was a little bit uh, shocked by that. I mean, I was like, okay, there are times where it's appropriate to be all bonds. Not really an option there either. Uh, are all cash and certainly not an option in order to provide for my family. So between the compensation issue and the handcuffs I had from, for investment strategies, I knew I had to leave. So I started Christensen Wealth Management. Uh, it'll be, it's amazing. I don't know how it's passed so fast. Nine, in January 1st, it'll be nine years. And I can do investing however I see fit. Uh, for my clients, as long as it's in their best interest. Yes, the whole fiduciary thing is real. Clients' best interest always comes first. And, but now I get paid based on my clients, 1% um, of my clients' account value, not based on what I put them in or whatever. So I can buy stocks, bonds, mutual funds, cryptocurrency-based stuff, precious metals, commodities, you name it. And it doesn't I have complete flexibility to navigate some crazy times like we are in today. So anyway, um, that's one. So I wanted to let you know that I have a ton of flexibility in that regard. And um, yeah, so let's go ahead and touch on. So what I want to do today is just share one really couple of few interesting ideas, <clears throat> some of the current state of the market and then investment ideas. Um, I want to say investment strategies, and then I want to spend a few minutes that I didn't get a chance to do at the summertime 2022 uh, talk where I want to teach you how to buy cryptocurrencies, how to transfer them, how to store them, how to secure them, because I don't know if you've noticed, but it is the future. And every single asset in our lives is going to be traded on or moved to a blockchain during our lifetimes and that includes home titles car titles stocks bonds everything is going to be on the blockchain because it is the future the most efficient way why is it that you can only buy a stock six and a half hours a day but you can buy bitcoin 24 hours a day seven days a week there's a disconnect there and one of the reasons why is because the banks can trade after hours all night long while you only get six and a half hours. So the banks love the fact that they can trade all day long while you only get a little window of the day. They can, they can uh, use that to their advantage. But it's only a matter of time. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but in, the la in my career over the last 20 years, the number of stocks traded on the stock exchange has gone from about 7,000 down to about 3,500. 
So because companies are merging, companies are going private. So the number of stocks is shrinking and the population of this country is rising. Uh, but the American population is being funneled into a smaller and smaller and smaller group of investments. And the valuations of those investments are from a, not the, not the price, but the actual, how much are you actually paying for a dollar worth of earnings? So the overvalued condition of the stock market is at 100 year overvalued levels right now because you've got everybody crammed into a small little pool and all of a sudden, 15 years ago, oh, hey, there's crypto over here. And so everything's moving rapidly in that direction because the younger generation is tech savvy and they see, they see opportunity. So real quick, let's... Uh, take a look at this chart Let me get my reading glasses <clears throat> one second there we go and so this here is a chart of the S&P 500's um, valuation so you can see over here we got 1900 the data really begins around 1920 you had the peak of 1929, the most overvalued stock market ever at that time, and then a 90% drop in the stock market. And then over the last many, many, many decades, since 1982, we came off the gold standard right around here. And so the national debt just went from a few hundred billion to $33 trillion today. And as a result, valuations of the stock market have climbed up to here. And the only time that we've been, so it's the red line that we're looking at here, the, this Hussman adjusted PE, which is a valuation level of the stock market. All I want you to know is that we are currently above the 2000.com bubble. And the only time pretty much that we were higher was the, the COVID lockdowns. When we shut down the economy and the stock market didn't move or actually crept higher because of the money printing, we were actually more overvalued. But if you take out COVID as an outlier, we are currently the most at 100 year overvalued levels. And we are currently looking at this, uh, You don't need to make sense of, of this chart either, but you see this blue line is negative. Well, this is the 10 year investment horizon of the stock market and currently it is negative. So what it's saying is the stock market's forward returns for the next 10 years, if, if nothing changes, we don't have a stock market crash, the stock market will have a negative return for the next 10 years just because of valuations. There's no more juice you can squeeze out of the turnip, right? Is that what they call it? So we need either 10 years of the stock market playing catch up, earnings catching up to the price, or we need a serious crisis that can bring elevated prices down 50 or 60%. In order to get normal valuations in the stock market, we need a 50 to 60% drop just to be normal, healthy valuations. So um, what do you do? Well, I mean, there's, there's other things and we, we won't get into that. Um, as far as Mike? all those, yeah. Uh, I'd like to point out that a lot of people don't understand stocks. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand stocks, but what he's sharing with us today, stocks indicate the health of the economy. And if, if you understand what he's saying, you can interpret what's about to happen or has happened. Uh, I don't think Mike's saying get involved in stocks. He's showing you what's taking place now. I'm just showing you the valuations do not justify. I mean, the stock market is 100% overvalued right now. And not every company but we're talking the S&P 500 for the most part, or the Dow, or the NASDAQ, or you name it. So this blue line is the forward outlook for the next 10 years, and this is where we are right now, as of the middle of October. 
any day now, this will be you know, another November issue from John Hussman will be published, Hussman Strategic Advisors. But you can see the red line always follows the blue. I mean, going back to 1871. And so the red line is going to creep down to here over the next 10 years. And what it means is that for the next 10 years, market will be declining and the forward outlook is a negative return for the next 10 years if the market doesn't crash. So sure, if we have a 50 or 60% drop, we'll go from here straight down to here, boom. Red comes screaming down like we did here in uh, 1999, red plummeted. So that's what he's saying. The, for 150 years or whatever, red is always caught up to blue and we need to have that to happen in the next 10 years. Just, just to play catch up. All right, um, so one of the things that I can do is I don't have to just, I don't have to do stocks. I can do stocks. There are some that are decent out there. I just recently bought some uh, stuff for my clients in the nuclear power space because there is no better form of energy on this planet other than maybe what Tesla created, which is buried in some bunker in Nevada. But uh, nuclear power is the most amazing form of energy and we have hundreds of years of nuclear waste that can be repurposed into power and the world is catching on to that. I mean, what is it? 50 nuclear power plants are being built in China in the next four years. And they're building three coal-fired power plants every week. And we're disassembling everything that we have here. So, but your nuclear power is strong in Europe, strong in China. But anyway, I do like some stocks, but this is just the S&P 500, which is dominated by 10 companies. Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, Google, Tesla, you name it. They dominate the entire market because the market weights, uh, the S&P 500 stock index is weighted by the size of the company. So the larger your company, a trillion dollar company or two trillion dollar company like Apple makes up a gigantic slice of the S&P 500 and the other 490 stocks make up like this little tiny percentage. So um, it is biased. Yeah. So real quick, um, one thing that you can do is invest in, um, let's say, let me make, uh, how to make this bigger. You can invest in di different industry sectors. And I'm going to, so this is a one year chart of all of the major industry sectors, energy, technology, the stock market index, gold, Cyclicals are discretionary, financials, home builders, healthcare, the medium size or mid cap stocks, retail stocks, sta consumer staples, food and beverage, and healthcare pharmaceuticals. And so you can see over the last 12 months, it's been quite a spaghetti of, of all kinds of chaos. But what I can do is I, I have a software program that helps identify which sector is trending the most at any given time. So I don't have to sit there and try to dig and research it. It'll literally text me and email me and say, hey, energy is where you want to be right now, for example. And that's, that's what my, the most recent uh, recommendation is. But what I want to show you is what happens over time if you, uh, one second here, uh, If you, this is a five-year five year chart, five-year chart. So over a five-year chart, what I'm, what I'm getting at is you can invest in different industry sectors. You can invest in energy for now, and then next week it could be, you know, next month, next quarter, it could end up being home builders or healthcare or gold or whatever. And over a five-year period, if you invested in the a sector rotation model, the yellow line is what you get, what would have gotten over the last five years. And I should probably say past performance is no guarantee of future results since I got a <laughs> microphone on. But, but industry sector rotation gave you this over the last five years, which would have been a 34% return, 
versus the S&P 500 over that period would have been, oh, sorry, 34% per year return versus 12% per year for the S&P 500, which is the white line right in here. So sector rotation can add extra fuel to, the, to your account in this example. And then if we go out, say, uh, is it 10 years? 10 years, yeah. It gets even bigger, so over a 10-year period using just, just these, none, no more, just that list, and rotating based on their momentum. The model would have been up 28% per year versus 12% per year for the stock market. So, and, and then I'll just go out a little further just for entertainment value. Um, here is the 20-year chart. And over a 20 year period, 28% per year versus 9.69% per year for the stock market. So again, the stock market's here. The other sector that did best over 20 years is the technology sector, that kind of orange color up there, it looks like. Um, but over that time frame, you can see, where is it? Um, uh, oh. I guess basically, I thought it was summarized here somewhere. You get the idea. I mean, over a 20 year period, it was up like 13,000% versus, uh, oh, and there versus 466% for the S&P 500. And the other thing I wanted to share with you is this cool little thing down here. This is a risk reward heat grid. And by doing sector rotation and also implementing a crash avoidance system, which is called this up here. I'll show it to you. I mean, it's just a little icon, but one of the most important things is to avoid crashes. And this thing's got what's called a storm guard. And when things are getting really nasty and there's smoke in the air and you can kind of sense there might be some fire in the market, this gets stormy. And right now we're at stormy. Um, until uh, as of like a week and a half ago, it was, it was getting really, really ugly. Um, right now we have a temporary reprieve and we'll see if the danger is over. The Fed looks like they're maybe willing to print some trillions of dollars more. But let's get back to the heat grid. And what this is saying is if you just bought the S&P 500, which is what most investors do, you have 100% of the risk of the stock market because you are just buying the stock market. But by using a sector rotation model, you're actually up here. You would have 44% of the risk of the stock market. And you'd have up here, you'd have greater returns. So the stock market averaged about 10% per year and took 100% of the risk by, by using a sector rotation, you have half, less than half, 44% of the risk of the stock market and well almost, I mean, almost 200% more return over a 20 year period. So in this case, 30% return annualized versus 10 and less than half the risk by rotating and also implementing a crash warning system. So. I just wanted to let you know kind of some of the things that go on behind the scenes. Oh, the other cool thing is how many times did this <coughs> software package, how did it do? Well, 79% of the quarters over the last 20 years made money. 67% of the quarters over 20 years beat the S&P 500. And I think... Uh, Oh, and for the most part, as far as trading goes, how, how often do you have to trade? Well, 4.7 trades per year on average. So about one trade every quarter. It's not, I mean, it, it, it signals a trade whenever it's needed. It doesn't just spread them out. It could be every, you know, all of a sudden in two weeks it changes. But less than five trades per year. So it's not like I... I'm day trading, all kinds of stuff. I'm just trying to follow the trend. And this past summer, back in the spring, 
this thing told me to buy home builders and holy cow the home builders just went screaming to the upside and uh, right now it's saying buy energy as of about three or four days ago all right let's see and that that's that's the uh investment jargon that i wanted to talk about right now i want to drip on crypto um this chart here is the last 20 years of the stock market s p 500 gold silver and bitcoin and so the stock market over 20 years up 328 percent Gold's up 393%, silver's up 334%, and Bitcoin's up 7,264%. So it's interesting that you'll never hear that gold and silver have outperformed the stock market over the last 20 years, but they have, just because of the vast amounts of money printing in the, in the world. But you can see Bitcoin up 7,000%, and it is absolutely dominating everything. And so some of my clients who are interested in crypto, um, I do have some institutional products uh, from Grayscale uh, is one of them. Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, Grayscale Ethereum Trust, Grayscale Litecoin, Grayscale Bitcoin Cash, and so on and so forth. And now the beautiful uh, nefarious BlackRock is now uh, getting um, permission to issue seven Bitcoin, uh, seven cryptocurrency ETFs. So BlackRock is getting in on the action, and you probably know they're the biggest money manager on the planet, and they're bringing institutional legitimacy to the cryptocurrency space because if BlackRock's getting in, that means everybody in the pension funds in 401ks and everybody is going to be able to get in on it. And so you're gonna have trillions of dollars pouring into this sector because now it has institutional and SEC legitimacy and permission to move forward. And over the last 12 to 24 months, cryptocurrencies have been destroyed because that's how BlackRock rolls. They, when they wanna get in on the action, BlackRock and JP Morgan and all these clowns, they can absolutely punish an entire industry sector so that it's dead. And then they can scrape up all of the flotsam and jetsam that's just kind of laying there uh, lifeless. And then they can get the SEC to give them the blessing. It's like, oh, all right, you can now have a big, you know, crypto ETFs. And so you can, over the last 12 months, Bitcoin and all the other cryptos are up 50 to 100 and you know, 50, many of them, the big ones are up 150 to 200 percent in the last 12 months. However, they were slaughtered from in the last 18 months, and we're still about half of Bitcoin got up to 70 thousand dollars, and now we're at 37 thousand. So yes, it's up 100 100 percent or so in the last 12 months, but we're still 50 percent off the highs pretty much. And the reason why is it, why. Why is it an important technology? It's the only technology that you can travel the world and nobody, has, nobody knows you have money with you. You can't go to the Spokane airport with a briefcase of gold or silver without them calling you aside and basically interrogating you all day. But you can walk through TSA with a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin um, because it's stored in the, in the internet, the entire global internet, and encrypted. You can walk from country to country to country and you can have your, your crypto and you can have your ability to buy stuff and nobody has a clue you have it with you. So in a world of totalitarian control, it's pretty much the only asset that you can travel the world freely without people knowing what you have. So uh, before I run out of time, how do we how, how do you do it? And you're, I'll, you know, you're always welcome to, what was that? Uh, you're, you're welcome to have coffee with me. I'll buy. But you can open up an account at, a, at an exchange like Coinbase or um, Gemini or Crypto.com or whatever. There's, Coinbase is the biggest. And you can uh, connect it to your checking or savings account and you can move some money into your Coinbase account and you can buy uh, one of dozens of cryptocurrencies. We'll just say Bitcoin, but that's just, 
an example. Once, once you've, it's as simple as doing a transaction on your normal bank system. You, you've connected accounts for bill pay. Well, Coinbase is like bill pay. You connect it to your checking and you move on $100 in and it, you purchase Bitcoin with it. And now it's in there and you have to wait five days for the trade to settle, just like so many other things in our lives because they want to make sure your bank has the money and they're not going to bounce the money. After five days, you can then move the money off of the exchange because as long as the money is in an exchange like Coinbase, it's not your, it's not in your possession. They can loan it out. It's not, you don't actually own it. They just owe it to you. So your, if you buy it, it's just part of a pool and they can, they can loan out. If, if the exchange crashes and goes out of business, you may have to wait years to get your money out. Uh, so it's critically important after that five day period to move your money off of the exchange so that you don't have money tied up in a company that can go bust. And there are a whole bunch of in, in, encrypted wallets that are out there on the internet. The one I use is called Exodus, but I also have an atomic wallet and I have a Theta wallet and I have, I like Exodus a lot. So we'll just go with Exodus. So, you move money from, I, I'm going through all this so that you can understand the terminology and the lingo. And then sometime if you want to have that chat, that's fine. You move your money from Coinbase onto Exodus and now it is secured, it's encrypted. And in order to open up an Exodus wallet, you just follow the procedure. It's completely anonymous. It doesn't ask your name or your address or your phone number or your ID or anything. It's just an encrypted online wallet and it generates 12 words that represent the key to your wallet and you write these 12 words down and you store them in multiple places and you never share them with anybody because if somebody has your 12 words they can take all your money but the uh, one of the cool things though is that if your computer blows up or your phone blows up you lose it in a boating accident you can buy another computer or another phone, download the Exodus app, enter your 12 words, and your money is still there. Your money is stored everywhere in the world that the internet exists. So if the US gets hit with an EMP and we're all in the dark for two years, wherever the internet is still alive, if somebody still has, a, say, a Starlink communication, you still have money, it's still there. So I'm just letting you know the security of the system is as you have to shut down the entire internet for you to lose all your money. And as long as you have your 12 words, your money is still safe. So let's just say we move the money from Coinbase over to Exodus and you have your new account and you got your 12 words and you're keeping your 12 words safe. That is a pretty, pretty bulletproof storage place. Now, don't, I'm not even going to get into quantum computing and all that stuff, and, and maybe it's possibility of being able to hack the blockchain and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but right now, it's really rock-solid security. And you can take it a whole nother level, and then I'll be done. So in the Exodus system, you can buy a little thumb drive called a ledger or a trezor. And these little thumb drives have a little keypad on them. And you, I mean, you've seen these things, they exist for other corporate security things, but uh, you plug in the ledger or the trezor into your computer and then inside your Exodus wallet, you can actually move your asset from the primary wallet into your trezor or ledger side of your wallet and store it there for long-term safekeeping. And why that's important is no, even if somebody is able to hack into your Exodus account, they cannot transfer money out without that device plugged into your computer. So it takes your wallet to a whole nother level of security. So if you have hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, you want maximum security uh, in your uh, wallet and that's one of the best ways to do it. So. Um, and then to wrap it up, how do you spend some of this stuff? Well, uh, one example is I have a crypto.com debit card. And if I want to buy a cup of coffee with 
say Bitcoin, I can transfer some of my Bitcoin onto my debit card. It's like a prepaid Visa card. Eventually, you won't need Visa or MasterCard. It'll go away at some someday. Not sure when, but right now that's the best we got. You got a crypto.com debit card. You can transfer some crypto on there, load your wallet and go, go spend money and buy coffee with it. Um, but uh, let me think, is there, a, so the keywords here are uh, Coinbase, Exodus, Trezor or Ledger, and um, I always want to say, how does it work real quick? Uh, there's a, as far as Bitcoin goes, there's tens of thousands of people like us around the world that are running a computer that is capable of very fast calculations. And what they're trying to do is guess the answer to a math problem that is generated every 10 minutes. So the whole Bitcoin system creates a, a, a pro, uh, uh, poses a calculation every 10 minutes and everybody has to ch race to guess it. And whoever guesses it correctly gets a few Bitcoin. And at, at $37,000 of Bitcoin, that's a pretty sweet incentive. So people have been incentivized to mine Bitcoin for a long time. And because there's tens of thousands of computers doing this around the world, that you have to shut down all of those computers in order to stop the network. That's how resilient it is. And that's just one of the projects. There's thousands of projects and each one is very exciting. So, um, all right, question time. So, will you explain the beginnings of the petrodollar? I can. And what effect that it has on our economy today? And the second thing is, um, um, when we digitize, how likely are we gonna digitize our dollar? And uh, how does that compare to crypto? Yeah, uh, real quick, any super, any, um, any other questions that I can fit in quickly before that? <laughs> That's, any other questions on that? And, yeah. What percentage of U.S. dollars in circulation have been printed in the last three years? <laughs> ah, good one. Yeah, it's like 60 or 65% of all U.S. dollars created in the last 250 years have been created in the last three years. So we've expanded the money supply by over 100% in the last three years. So that's um, the true inflation yeah, yeah, true inflation is probably close to 20% or something like that. Um, but it's funny this week they say, "Oh, inflation's slowing," so everybody took it as, "Oh, inflation's going down." No, it's just it's just accelerating slower. <laughs> Plus, it's, they're not calculating energy and food. No. Yeah, right. I mean, you got to look at they they um, if you look at the way they calculated the inflation back in the 80s before they took away all the inflationary items. Uh, yeah, we're at like 15 to 20 percent inflation or something like that. So, yeah. Question. Uh, I'm answering Nels's question. OK, real quick. All right, go ahead. really fast. If, yeah. Uh, so it was it 1971, 19. So as you know, 1971, we came off the gold standard. And I think it was 1973, we worked uh, in order to maintain some sort of uh, value of the dollar because without gold, what value did we have other than our stellar reputation at the time? So uh, we made a deal with Saudi Arabia back in the early 70s, 73, I think, saying if you sell oil to the world only in dollars, we'll provide you basically unlimited weaponry and protection. And so for the last, what, 50 years, uh, the dollar has been backed by Saudi Arabia's use of oil as an asset. So we replaced a gold-backed dollar with an oil-backed dollar, also known as a petrodollar. Well, now, as of this year, you might, the winds might change month to month, but Saudi Arabia's, I think they see that we're... Uh, we're not such a great partner anymore. So they're starting to, they're joining the BRICS nations. So they're partnering up with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and about what, 20 or 30 other countries. And so now they're starting to sell oil and other currencies, uh, Chinese yuan and stuff like that, and rupees and things. So the, the dollars backing by oil is going away. And that's one of the reasons why our interest rates are skyrocketing uh, up until recently. 
Uh, nobody's buying our bonds. Nobody's buying our debt because in the past, our treasury bonds were used in trade for oil. Well, now that's all going away. So the answer to Nels's question is, we don't have anything backing the dollar anymore, really, because the, do the oil backed is gone, the gold backed is gone, the silver backed is gone. And so uh, it's time for the old dollar system to come to an end because it doesn't have any value anymore other than the fact that we all use it still and we're willing to accept it. But the, the Federal Reserve, the central banks of the world are definitely rolling out their digital currencies because they want to control us even more. They want to control what we buy, you know, what we spend and how we live our lives. And so they're going to deliberately destroy the currency and then move us over to a digital controlled version and the only way to avoid that digital totalitarian currency is through off, off things that are not part of the traditional system. And I, I mean, bartering is one thing, but you got gold, you got silver, which are recognized around the world. And then all the cryptocurrencies are outside the system for the most part. Some are centralized and are evil, but truly decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, uh, Bitcoin Cash, and stuff like that. Nobody owns them. They're owned by the network. And so they're truly uncontrollable. And that's one thing that the global central banks don't like. So um, if you want to avoid the global central bank digital currencies, there's a very few ways you can do it. Um, but it, it would pay, it would benefit you to start learning about all this stuff now because we don't know how many days we have left until we get that uh, Fed coin or the Fed digital currency shoved down our throats. So, all right, you good? Yeah, so a quick question was um, if, I, if I've got, if I go to my bank and I take $1,000 cash out, right? that cash, I can come and buy a lot of coffee for $1,000 cash. Or you might say, well, hey, let's put this into some silver because the goal is that maybe it will expand a little bit. Or, hey, let's put it into the stock because the goal is maybe this will expand a little bit, a return on investment, right? In the crypto world, when you put money in, is there an expansion or is it just a one-for-one -one trade? Am I just securing the money that I already have to protect it to get back out when I need it. You mean, is there profit potential? Sure. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, as you see on the, saw on the chart uh, behind me, I started buying Bitcoin in 2015 when it was $365. Now it's $37,000. There's, and the reason why the price has done that is because millions of people have woken up to the fact that the psychopaths of the world are trying to steal all of our wealth and take full control of our spending ability. And so millions of people are getting off the old system and moving into the new system. And there's only a few projects that are reliable and trustworthy enough to command putting your money in them for, I don't, for security, I guess you could say. And, and Bitcoin is the first, it's the strongest, it's the biggest. It's not fancy, it's just made as a store of value. But the more people that come into the, net, into the community of Bitcoin and start buying some, the more scarce the Bitcoin is. There's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever. And it's going to take another 100 years for all of those to get unlocked. And every four years, the number of Bitcoin issued gets cut in half. So that creates a scarcity. If, if, the, if the reward is cut in half every four years, that means there's less and less and less being issued. And there's millions more people piling into the system. That's going to create the scarcity that drives price up in that regard. And most Bitcoin investors buy it, lock it in their wallet, and they never sell it. And you, uh, it's all trackable, meaning the, the behavior or number of, of Bitcoin that are um, been held for years is 
astonishingly high. So people are buying it and holding it, buying it and holding it. They're not using it yet as far as day-to-day -day transactions. And that means there's just not a lot circulating, creating even more scarcity. Yeah. So subtract the US dollar from that. And how do we value the Bitcoin? If, if we were to go off the, the US dollar, then how do I uh, spend my Bitcoin relative to everyday items like a coffee? Everything eventually should be valued in Bitcoin as well and for now as well as in the dollar. You may know that um, El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender. I think it might be the only country that made Bitcoin legal tender. Um, they, they, have, they were on the US dollar. They adopted the US dollar as their currency many years ago. And two years ago, they said, all right, Bitcoin's legal tender. So now you can do any transaction in El Salvador with Bitcoin or dollars. And if you go to buy something in El Salvador, it's quoted in dollars or Bitcoin. And eventually, if the dollar turns into Venezuelan boulevards, it's just, they're just gonna drop the dollar from the store shelf altogether and it's just gonna be a Bitcoin number. And if you wanna buy this bottle of soda or whatever, you scan it and cha-ching, it'll, it'll, it, you're just gonna pay in Bitcoin and the Bitcoin will be the quoted price at some point. Because at the rate we're going in the last 30 days, the interest on our national debt has doubled in the last 30 days. And the government has got short-term interest rate debt coming due every day and they're refinancing it with more short-term debt at four or five percent whereas it was one percent so we have an exponentially rising national debt and interest payments and as of last week our interest on our national debt is now over a trillion dollars a year and rising and it's about 40 billion dollars a day is added to our national debt so it's, uh, it's getting worse and worse. And so the answer to your question is, I would likely see a day when things are just simply priced in Bitcoin instead of an actual currency. If the currencies okay. keep losing their value so fast. And that's uh, coming back to the fact that a lot of cryptocurrencies have a fixed quantity. There is no limit to the amount of trillions that the US Federal Reserve can create. And there's no limit to the amount of gold that we can dig out of the ground. They just keep digging it out of the ground. But there's a limit to how much Bitcoin, Litecoin, um, Bitcoin Cash, and several other projects. A lot of the cryptocurrencies have a fixed quantity that cannot just be inflated away like the dollar. So that gives you scarcity. Yeah. And how do you make money off of that? If we were to get rid of the dollar, then how do you value a Bitcoin? and how do you invest? Can, yeah, you, can you still make money? Let me answer that question in a second. Let me let David ask. comment about that actually. Yeah. So my thinking is silver and gold have actually held basically their buying power throughout time. So we could value things in silver and gold and if the cryptos are volatile, the amount of crypto you pay is based on its relationship to silver and gold. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. because gold does come out of the ground at a certain rate, but it's also demanded at at least that rate. So it actually holds pretty stable. Yeah. Whereas yeah. crypto does have volatility. I mean, that's been my experience is the volatility's kind of made me a little wary of it. <laughs> yeah, most of the volatility of crypto has been the US government and the SEC um, working in collusion with the Wall Street banks to scare people out of it and to prevent people from adopting it because the faster people adopt crypto, the faster the dollar falls to zero. So they are trying their hardest to roadblock Americans every single step of the way and scare the crap out of everybody because of the volatility. Like, oh, Bitcoin, I don't want any of that. That's just, oh, that's just scary. That's just, oh, that's risky. You talk about risky, look at the dollar. I mean, it's been flushed down the drain in the last three years. It's lost over 20% of its purchasing power in the last three years. That's, that's risky. Meanwhile, you know, Bitcoin was $3,000 to start 2020, and now it's $37,000. It's up 10x in the last three, four years. So, yeah. Um, when, you, when you pull out 
Bitcoin and put it in until the day comes where you can pay in Bitcoin, which actually some things do, obviously. You can pay in Bitcoin directly. But right now, if you move stuff over, it's going to transfer that money into cash and then pay the... Like, you put it, your Bitcoin on a, on a card or whatever, and then you pay the company. It transfers that into dollars for the company that the company receives, right? Yeah. So while there's this intermediary company, do you get... Do you know how the taxes are Do does it count as capital gains at the time of liquidation from that asset? Yeah, there's, there's a, technically it's, if you spend a lot of it, I mean, if you're spending little bits and pieces here and there, I, I wouldn't worry about it. But if you make, if, if you bought your Bitcoin 10 years ago and you're basically up, an insane amount and you spend some on coffee and you really want to cl claim that on your taxes <laughs> you just claim it as a long-term capital gain but the key is until there's further clarity on taxes and all that stuff just just don't use it just buy it and sit on it and don't use it for now until things are worked out I mean there's a lot of um, a lot of desire for there just to simply be a a blanket statement that says any purchase under two hundred fifty dollars or whatever is not taxed or something, uh, but we have yet to see that. Um, but for me, whenever in the past several years, whenever I've bought or sold, I've just taken a short term short term gain, short term loss, long term gain, long term loss, and um, I, I use a little bit of my crypto. Cri debit card just to just to use it and and i'm not going to worry about claiming a three dollar cup of coffee on my taxes it's not a big deal but at some point people are going to have to say that buying or selling bitcoin gold silver is not a taxable event at some point because you just simply cannot cl claim all these little purchases on your taxes every year it's just a uh, it's just impossible and I, w I wouldn't worry about it right now but for the purposes of this conversation if you ever bought some just sit on it for a few years and not use it because as long as your dollar has value why not spend that spend your dollars don't spend your crypto yeah. last question and then we need to wrap this up when the dollar goes digitized wouldn't it be more comparable to crypto when the dollar goes digitized, okay, so the the dollar goes digitized, it is going to be controlled by the Federal Reserve, and it's going to be an unlimited inflation potential. So the 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 U.S. digital dollar will have no limit to the amount that they can create. They could double the quantity overnight and impoverish the United, you know, the American people. So if you have all your money in uh, the Federal Reserve digital dollar and then like, oh, we're uh, doubling the quantity uh, and immediately you've just lost half your wealth because the Fed just dictated it. So not only that, but as you know, like I said, it's being the, the entire project would be created or, and monitored and maintained by the Fed or the European Central Bank or the Bank of Japan or whatever. All these central banks are trying to do all that. And so the, the benefits of Bitcoin, Litecoin, et cetera, uh, Bitcoin Cash and many others is the fact that they are fixed quantity and decentralized, meaning there are thousands of computers around the world like you and I, any single one of you could run a node at home. I run two. Uh, I have two um, computers running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing, uh, participating in the network uh, because A, it's fun, it's educational, it is rewarding, and uh, yeah, I mean, if you believe in something, pitch in. It's like, if you believe in America, do your part. If you believe in decentralized currency alternatives and stores of wealth, why not jump in if you have a computer that's a desktop or something do a little bit of work let it let it work and earn some rewards for you and and there's millions of people around the world who are chipping in and doing that with different projects and there's tens of thousands who are doing that with bitcoin it's just bitcoin costs a lot of electricity so not a lot of people 
uh, run Bitcoin mining operations. Maybe to help directly answer the question, it is a cryptocurrency. It's just a centralized crypto instead of a decentralized crypto. And, and that's what the point it was. Trying yeah. To make. Okay. Thank you for that. So, um, will you be here for a while to answer other questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, a um, couple things, group guys. Um, Cody oh. had to go. Go ahead. Real quick. So, if you don't want to fool around with all this stuff, some of my clients have bought the Grayscale Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, and top 10 crypto ETFs. And they put them in their IRAs, they put them in their trust accounts, they put them in their investment accounts, whatever. So if you want to do something like that with your traditional investment accounts, there are ways that I can do that just using normal channels. And there's gonna be more and more and more of them every day. So go ahead. Awesome. So. Um couple things. Um, I, I want to thank Michael because he literally got the call from us yesterday saying, hey, you want to present tomorrow? <laughs> and so um, it's really hard to make spreadsheets sexy. And uh, I, I do have to tell you, Michael, everybody was really engaged. And anytime we have a bunch of questions at the end, it shows that it was a powerful presentation. So it was really valuable. I would encourage anybody to take him up on coffee and have future questions. I know for a fact when Lynn woke up this morning, she was thinking, I should buy two nodes and run them 24 hours a day because it'll help the whole the whole thing, the whole well, engine. Well, I met her husband so. about two years ago at uh, Thomas uh, Hammer Coffee. And, uh, I mean, what is he, 75, 70? 77, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's like, I want to buy some Bitcoin. Good. Like, all right. You know, and, <laughs> See, I stand and, corrected. And, you probably have three notes at home. <laughs> I didn't know that. So, um, he was, yeah. So, guys, uh, let's all thank Michael. Let's give him a round of uh, appreciate it, Michael.